Nate was a brilliant challenger. If you hear me using the word challenger, it is because I love that word, because I love what challengers did to correct the inequities of this society. It's not a win or lose game to this effect. We're not asking them to lose anything, we're asking them to give something, something that should have been given years ago. Out of 30,000 craft union jobs in Pittsburgh, only two and a half percent are held by blacks. We're asking for equal treatment here. It took my husband 28 years to get the union built up. Now we're gonna let one man step in and break down that union? Take your proposals, go back to the street or go wherever you want and to hell with you. This is just like a football game. We only have one half of the game over with. You were standing there watching. I was too. And the guy walking beside me was arrested, didn't say anything. There's no confrontation. We have to put some black people on jobs. If something isn't done about it, the city's going to be in trouble. What do you intend what, what do you intend to do? What, kind of what does trouble mean? The story of Nate Smith's life is about an individual who seemed to rise up from nowhere, yet triumphed over the man. I was born in 1929, and uh, I was, felt like being black at that time was a sin. I was born at home. And in the Hill District? In the Hill District, or Rose Street. What did your, your, your father do? My father was a janitor. He was gone a lot from when I was young. He, was, he lived there right. and he came home every night. Right. He fed us and clothed us, what have you. But we didn't socialize. What, what was your, your parents' attitude towards race relations? When you're white, you're right. When you're yellow, you're mellow. When you're brown, you're brown. You're black, you're black. They believed in that. So uh, they, uh, they knuckle under the pressure of white men. I was headstrong. I, I believed that what I was doing was the right thing to do, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I ran away so young. I was in sixth grade, and in September, I was supposed to go back to school. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to uh, seventh grade. Instead, I, I went to Navy. Lying about his age, Nate joined the Navy and was deployed into active duty when he was 13. I was a steward on a ship. They would cook the food, and I would put my hand behind me like this here, and he had to put on it in front of the lieutenant, the captain, be very careful, can't spill it up. I learned a lot from it. I learned how to fight, for one thing. There was 3,000 people on the ship. I was only African-American. They tried to bother me quite a bit. But somehow or another, I fought them, and I knocked two of them out with my fists. Jeff Plains attack. The guy who does speaking with a loudspeaker on a ship is hollering, a bad ship, a bad ship. <laughs> I have seen people ripping and running. I said, what's wrong? They said, we got hit, we're going down. And the ship was driven. But you know what? It didn't bother me. It didn't scare me at all. I said, if I get killed, I'll be a hero. Like before it started, I was just a, I was a steward on a ship. Giving the white man big names every morning, all that kind of shit. Yeah. But when it came down to, to our life was in the state, yeah. I became a man. That's when they found out how old I was. They flew me back to Pittsburgh with honorable discharge. 
Nate came home to a different country. The war was ending and spirits were high. Pittsburgh's Hill District was no exception, earning the name Little Harlem. Oh, all kind of things were going on there, yeah. A lot of clubs and what have you. I would go down to the clubs and watch the girls dance and this and that, but I just never drank or smoked and uh, I just, I would go home. From there, I went back to high school for about two months. I didn't like school, so I just left. I was in Fifth Avenue High School, and the rumor was this guy is here. Uh, he was in the Navy, and there was this debate as to what grade we should put him in, because he's been fighting for your country. And a couple of days later, I met the Snatesman that the school was talking about. Nate and Minnie soon married, and with a family to support, Nate had to pick up on an old hustle he had learned in the Navy. I was 17 when I started fighting. We had a boxing club, my father and Art Rooney, and I did the publicity, and I was a, the matchmaker. Nate would come to every weigh-in, just in chance somebody might not pass their physical that was at his, at his weight limit. I was available if they needed me, so they called me Nate Available Smith. That was my fight name. I had 105 fights all told. I was many fights as I won, but I just didn't see myself as a champion. So I started working construction. In 1951, Nate saw an opportunity to make a move. For the first time ever, the World Heavyweight Boxing Championship was staged in Pittsburgh. And I was on as a standby. Mr. Snyder was the head of the union at that time, the operating engineers union. Mm -hmm. And he said, Nate, I hear you're fighting on that card. I said, would you like to go see? He said, well, they're out of tickets. I said, if you give me four tickets, will you give me my card? I, he said, yeah. So instead of me taking the money that they were going to pay me for the standby, I took it in tickets and took the tickets down to the operating engineers union. The next day, they gave me my ticket, not ever thinking that I would keep up my dues, which I did. All the machinery they had, I, I, could, I could run. I learned how to run. I fell in love with the heavy equipment. It was real strong, and the, and the pay was good. It was, I was the only black guy on a lot of jobs. I had some racial problems with some of the white guys. One of the operating engineers in here called me a nigger and this and that. I took my bulldozer and pushed it right up against his... He jumped off the me, and I jumped off the me. He said, what are you doing? Are you trying to kill me? I said, yeah. I said, you call me another man, I'm going to kill you. And the word got out, you better not call Nate Smith a nigga. By the time Nate is 30 years old, he's achieved more than most African Americans of his time. But he's not content, and neither is the country. The 1960s, a time of great progress and a time of extreme conflict. especially concerning the civil rights of African Americans. It ought to be possible for every American to enjoy the privileges of being American without regard to his race or his color, without being forced to resort to demonstrations in the street. Amid controversy, the Civil Rights Act is passed in 1964, prohibiting discrimination in public facilities, government, and employment, although equal opportunity is still a distant dream. Around the late 60s, the movement was beginning to shift 
from the integration of the South back to the urban centers of the North and the growing confrontation around economic issues. The cities were experiencing unparalleled poverty. There had been, in many cities across the country, riots in response to this urban unrest. But there had not been any riots in Pittsburgh. It took the assassination of Dr. King to take Pittsburgh over the edge. And it is also around that time that the discussion of the rights of black people to get employment in the major construction projects that were going on in Pittsburgh was also reaching its apex. Pittsburgh was in the midst of a renaissance. Federal funds were reshaping the city skyline and the construction industry was booming. In 1968, I was an apprentice iron worker. I was 20 years old, got married and bought a house. We were immediate middle class. With our wages, we were living good. But while money flows into union jobs, blacks are almost completely shut out. The unions were white, and so were the employers. We were a union contractor, a solid union contractor, and all of our hiring was really done through the unions. Historically, in the trade unions, it, there is family involved. I know families were three generations were in the same union. There were no minorities in the unions at that time. Oh, there were, I can't say none, but there, there were few and far between. The American dream is on bacon eggs on Sunday morning. I believe that. And the only way you have bacon eggs on Sunday morning is you work, get a job, and get some money. I don't believe that white labor union leaders at that time believed that joining the unions and having jobs was a right. And so the basic fundamental ability to earn a living, to send your kids to college, to have a decent house that you can put your family in, to have health care when you get sick, those fundamental human desires, the American dream. Black people saw it as a fundamental right. Blatant discrimination was calling the attention of national news media. Pittsburgh's new $35 million sports stadium symbolizes the city's construction boom. The unions are bringing in workers from out of state, while the unemployment rate among non-whites in Pittsburgh last year was the highest in the nation. If they come down and are qualified, we will accept them. Getting qualified by union standards has been the biggest obstacle for blacks over the years. The fact is that out of 30,000 craft union jobs in Pittsburgh, only 2.5% are held by blacks, who make up more than 20% of the population. Groups like the NAACP began an aggressive campaign on the streets. There was just something always going on that would allow people to know that we were not satisfied with what was coming to black Pittsburghers. We were having protest marches and we were having what they call economic boycotts, you know, picketing businesses. But all of these demonstrations were because there was no black people working on the jobs. And that's where I met Nate Smith. One time we were meeting and negotiating with uh, the county commissioners, and somehow that day we were zeroing in on heavy equipment. Of course, we got the message that we got so often from white people who had the power, we would be glad to hire some of you, but there just isn't one. Nate jumped up and he said, well, I'll tell you this, I know how to handle heavy equipment, and I will train anybody and you can no longer say that we can't get black men to 
handle heavy equipment. And I, I get chills now when I hear that. I, you know, when I repeat that, I get chills because that's how I felt. You know, here was this man that we had not regarded as well as we should have regarded. And here he is now, our savior at that particular time. And then that was it, I think, when he stood up and realized that he had the power, he could use power to help other people. That started Nate's evolution, and he started to do things. After the meeting, Nate went to Community Acts in Pittsburgh, the city's only manpower development program. He came to my office, and he talked to me about trying to train African Americans. And uh, I indicated to him the idea was good, but there's not a discretionary pool of money that I can have just to address this concern. He said, well, uh, it's important that you try to find some money. Nate recognized it was going to be a hot summer on the streets of Pittsburgh if young black men returning home from Vietnam couldn't find jobs. About 1968, I guess I must have been around 23 years old. Probably been out the army for about a year. And I came through the, through the neighborhood, and there was an old man, Scott. He was actually cleaning brick. And uh, they were doing a lot of demolition. And uh, I said to Mr. Scott, I said, uh, how much money do you make, man, clean these brick? He said, oh, I make about 8 or $10 a day. I said, yeah, that guy operating that piece of equipment. How much money?